So listen again to the words of Matthew, the 17th chapter of the gospel, and by God's spirit, living words for us this day, the story of the transfiguration. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground, were overcome by fear, but Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up, and do not be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, break open your word before us as we ponder it that we too might be transfigured and transformed for your purpose in the world, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So just just before the start of Lent, every year the church goes mountain climbing. We go following Jesus. On the mountain we see him as he really is, by him, with him, and in him the glory of God shines. And the season of Epiphany ends as it began with a shining star. For here is Jesus, whom scripture calls the bright morning star, shining on the Mount of Transfiguration just as the light from heaven shined above his birthplace in Bethlehem, brackets this shining star to Epiphany. So why this event and and why three disciples experiencing it. Well, well, it, it appears that the disciples are, are getting the picture of who, of who Jesus is. In the chapter before this text, we hear one of the most important exchanges between Jesus and his disciples, a conversation that took place in Caesarea Philippi, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do the people say that I am? And they give a variety of answers because they've heard a number of different things from people talking about the master. And then Jesus pointedly asks them, the disciples, who do you, who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter, without hesitation, blurts out, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. But clearly, they still don't fully get it. Because when, in the next breath, Jesus tells them they're going to be leaving the Galilean countryside to head for Jerusalem, where he will undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, be killed and rise on the third day, it is Peter again, this time, who blurts out, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. Maybe Peter's thinking, we're doing so well here in Galilee. Jesus rebukes Peter for his remarks and in the verses immediately following invites his disciples to take up their cross and follow in his way. So it is, it is six days, our text began six days later, it is six days after that conversation in Caesarea Philippi that the transfiguration takes place. And and these three disciples, who number one, didn't hear the angel voices like the shepherds at Jesus' birth. Number two, didn't see a star in the sky pointing to the place where Jesus had been born. Weren't present at Jesus' baptism when the dove descended and a voice from heaven shouted out. Now these disciples have their own epiphany, a revelation 
one more revelation of who Jesus really is. So that these disciples would understand he is not just a great teacher and a wonder worker, but is indeed the very presence of the divine, as John said to the children. The Son of God in all his glory. And, and a voice from heaven says, and I, lo- I love this, after all that, you know, listen to him. Like, pay attention. As if by chance God might actually know what the disciples need for the days to come. Listen to him. I'm pretty certain that moment was also what Jesus needed. This affirmation, this this confirmation, this this moment of epiphany and, and glory are what equipped Jesus for the journey ahead. A journey toward a cross toward his passion and his death, and yes, a resurrection. It was a reminder, a reminder for him and, and them that the power and the presence of God and all the history of the law and the prophets, Moses and Elijah, were wrapped up in Jesus as he turns his face to fulfill his calling. But why, why do... Why do we, why, do, why does the church climb this mountain once again? And, and I believe it's for the very same reasons that Jesus did. And in some way, I think it's for the very same reasons you and I gather in worship every Sunday. We take to climbing the mountain. We take time for that, time away from hungry to be fed, children to be clothed, sick to be healed, grieving to be consoled, just as Jesus did, to get a glimpse of glory. Perhaps a glimpse of the promised land, to to be reminded of the one to whom we belong, to see where it is we are headed, and to be equipped anew for the mission that waits us on the other side of the hill. Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Transfiguration moments are always where our hearts are transformed, renewed, reaffirmed, rekindled in the way of the cross. It's where you and I are equipped for the journey into the valley where the demands and the challenges of the world will require the very best of us. In fact, may require our very selves. And as it does every year, this comes just on the edge, right on the verge of Lent, when you and I are invited once again to examine. Examine our lives, our hearts, ourselves, and renew again our willingness to take up our cross and follow Jesus into the world. Mountaintop experiences never last. They're not destinations. They're epiphanies along the way. Jesus said to them, don't put up any tents. Not a stopping place. I, we, have work to do. On April 3rd, 1968, Martin Luther King Jr. addressed a crowd in Memphis, Tennessee. It's all right for the preacher to talk about long white robes over yonder and all their symbolism. But ultimately, people want some suits and dresses and shoes to wear down here. It's all right for the preacher to talk about streets flowing with milk and honey, but God has commanded us to be concerned about the slums down here and the children who can't eat three square meals a day. It's all right to talk about the new Jerusalem. But one day God's preachers must talk about the new New York, the new Atlanta, the new Philadelphia, the new Los Angeles, and the new Memphis, Tennessee. And then King said, we've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter to me now because I've been to the mountaintop. 
I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know, to know that tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. The next day, King was killed. But for him, as it is to be for us a vision of and a confirmation of the power and presence and glory and promises of God are what equip us to give our very selves to the purposes of God in the world. These are the things that equip you and me to be the shining light, to reflect the light of Christ in the world. It is why we, it is why the church worldwide climbs a mountain every year at this time for the church to be equipped to be the light of Christ. For more than 30 years, the Reverend Fuad Banan served a small Presbyterian congregation in an overwhelmingly Muslim area of West Beirut. In 1983, during Arab-Israeli fighting, the Israeli army invaded Lebanon. No one knew how far they would go, but members of Bonin's congregation believed the Israelis would ultimately take Beirut and then try to starve out any Palestinian fighters still in the city. In light of that thinking, church leaders decided they would stockpile food in preparation for the siege that was likely to happen. Indeed, the Israeli army did cut off West Beirut. No one was allowed to enter or to leave, and no food was allowed in. The church leaders met to make arrangements for distributing the food that they had stored up. And at the meeting, the elders weighed two very different proposals. Proposal one, food would be distributed first to members of the congregation, then as supplies permitted to other Christians in West Beirut, and if any was left, to Muslims. Proposal number two, food would be distributed to Muslims first, then to non-church member Christians, and lastly, if there was anything left, to members of their congregation. Pastor Bonin said the session meeting lasted six hours. Elders, you know. It finally ended when one senior, deeply respected, but usually quiet member of the governing board stood up and she said to her colleagues, if we do not demonstrate the love of Christ in this place, who will? The second proposal passed. Food was distributed first to Muslims, then to other Christians, and finally, to members of the congregation. When Pastor Bonin told the story some 20 years later, he added two footnotes. First, he said that the Muslim community of Beirut is still talking about what their congregation did. Second, he said there was actually enough food for everyone that day. They'd had their own modern day experience of loaves and fishes. The congregation that knew the power, the transfiguring, transforming, renewing power of Jesus Christ that caused them to live that out in the world underwent another mountaintop experience because they followed in his way. And decades later, they're still talking about it. As I said, mountaintop experiences never last. They are not destinations, but rather epiphanies along the way. 
but when you have them, take note. Write something in, in your journal. Mark the anniversary. Tell, tell your friends about it or, or write it down for your children and your children's children. Like Peter or James or John eventually shared this story with the others. Because although such events cannot be preserved, the memory of the experience can be and should be. For memories bring transformation. Decades later, they're still talking. And that's why such things are given to us. They are what equip you and me for the journey to continue to empower us to be the transfigured and transforming light of Christ in the world. Fear not. You don't have to be in the middle of a, a, a war and, and, and it doesn't have to be as grand as feeding a village or maybe at least in the middle of a visible war. This past October, I received a thank you card in the mail. Special thanks to you, it says at the top, and you probably can't tell from here, but it's sunflowers. The printed text, you know, the card text, says, kind hearts are the gardens, kind thoughts are the roots, kind words are the flowers, kind deeds are the fruits. Thinking of you and giving thanks for the wonderful, and person is crossed out and people is written in, thanks for the wonderful people you are. And then from the center of the card, here's what she wrote. For all that blessed my life recently, I give thanks. When my car broke down on 202, I was able to wind my way and maneuver into your parking lot. And there I found comfort and joy and peace. I was offered water to drink, a needed bathroom facility, a place to sit and relax, and an extra charge for my phone. I loved walking in your sunflower. I met so many wonderful people and offers of help. You know how sometimes people will say about somebody, oh, her face is just glowing. I'm pretty sure if you'd been in my office with me while I was reading this card and the thanks the woman who experienced the helpfulness of Jesus' followers in this place, you would have seen my face aglow. Light it up with the joy and wonder and power of Christ at work in the members and staff of this congregation. And that experience equipped me for the work of the rest of the day and, and probably for the work of the rest of the week. And lo and behold, here it is months later. And I'm talking about it. Our individual experiences, mountaintop experiences with God and God's ways are the very things that change us and charge us. And if you and I will just listen to him on a journey, be lifted up like those disciples were that day from the fears that bow us down and have the courage to step off the mountain and move back into the world, move forward, I guarantee you we will be the very ones God uses to be the light that shines in the darkness for others. May Jesus' transfiguration and our memory of it and the transformation the memory of it brings to our lives empower you and me to be his light in and for the sake of the world. May it be so. May it be so. Amen.